Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome back to this edition of Quarantine Collections as we're all self-isolating to flatten this curve and do what we can to get on the other side of this pandemic so our lives can all get back to normal. My name is Travis Gilbert. I'm the Educator and Collections Coordinator here at the Old Baldy Foundation. And we have been bringing you these virtual experiences for the past uh, week. You notice my lovely, uh, I think we're calling it quarantine beard I have going on here. I have been in uh, self-isolation on um, Baldhead Island for over a week now. I think I can count on one hand the amount of people I've interacted with over the past uh, week or so. Uh, so we're all in this together. I hope you're sane out there. I hope you've been able to find a routine, uh, maybe some home workouts, some reading, some home improvement projects. You've just been dying to uh, get finished. Uh, whatever we can to keep uh, some semblance of normalcy here while we go through this unprecedented um, experience that, that we're all going to remember. It's, it's quite historic. Well, today for this uh, Quarantine Collections, I thought I would bring out uh, one of my favorite oral histories that we have in our archives. Uh, so you might ask, uh, what is an oral history? We've discussed previously or last week what a primary source is, that first person account, someone who was alive and experienced that historical event and uh, actually wrote it down for us historians later on in the future to uh, read and to learn. Well, we also learned about what secondary sources are. Uh, books, uh, folks who, uh, like Ethel Herring, was uh, not there, did not experience the historical events firsthand, but she is writing about those historical events from those primary sources, so that's a secondary source. Well, an oral history is basically a recording. Uh, it's kind of like a primary source in the sense that you are interviewing somebody that experienced those historical events, and you are eventually going to transcribe that interview so historians later on can read that interview and learn about that historical event. So in a sense, uh, oral histories are the oldest form of history. Before we have the written word, uh, folks are passing down their experiences, their memories, uh, orally. They're telling their children around the campfire uh, what they learned or what they experienced long ago. Those children are remembering what that ancestor or what that elder had told them. And then they're going to tell their children uh, so it can be passed down through word of mouth. So in a sense, again, oral histories are the oldest form of history we have. Since the birth of recording devices and these lovely little devices we carry around, uh, oral histories have taken on a, a rebirth. Now that we have all this technology, such as video cameras and recording devices, uh, there have been a, a surge of oral histories and oral history projects that have occurred recently. And one of those is the oral history of Margaret Swan Hood. So Margaret Swan Hood is the eldest daughter of Captain Charlie. And if you folks are familiar with Baldhead Island or Baldhead Island's history, Captain Charlie is this universal character. He's, uh, you know, what a, I call him the, the first mayor of Baldhead Island. And Captain Charlie is the first or the principal keeper of Cape Fear Light Station, which is the third and final lighthouse completed on Baldhead Island that was in operation from 1903 to 1958. Uh, way out about three miles or so from this location here at Old Baldy towards the modern day Baldhead Island Conservancy, uh, out towards the Cape or the Shoals Club. So being the eldest daughter of Captain Charlie, Margaret Swan Hood 
experienced uh, her childhood here on Bald Head Island. And fortunately, she was at an old enough age when the family moved to Bald Head Island that she was able to recollect those experiences later on when she was of an older age. And we are very fortunate that uh, Polly Fish, uh, who's a, a kind of another universal figure on Bald Head Island in the development era, she sat down with Margaret Hood and was able to record this oral history about what it was like to be raised to grow up as a child here on Bald Head Island before most of these other amenities uh, were here on the island. So, uh, hey, if you're listening out there, we've got a few listeners here on this rainy uh, Tuesday morning. I almost said Monday. It's, it's my Monday. Um, so I'm going to follow along here. If you are listening out there, give us a shout out. Let us know uh, where you're listening from, what your connection to Bald Head Island is. We'd love to hear from you, and I will uh, you know, shout out uh, your comments here. If you have any questions, um, throw us a question in those comments as well, and uh, we will attempt to find an answer for you. So Margaret Swan Hood begins her interview uh, by saying, uh, wasn't it, you know, talking about it was a dangerous place, if you can tell, being out on this abandoned island uh, with, with nothing out here, and you being a child without much supervision because mom and dad uh, had some, some pretty busy roles. Again, her dad was Charles Norton Swan, and her mom was Marie Rose Swan. Uh, Marie Rose uh, married uh, Captain Charlie right around the turn of the 20th century, and they, uh, she gave birth to Margaret, the eldest daughter, at a place they knew as Mosquito Inlet Lighthouse in the year 1900. Today, you may know it as Ponce de Leon Lighthouse. It's down in Florida, and that's where Margaret, their first child, was born. So when they move here in 1903, uh, Margaret is, is really a, a toddler. Uh, so you can imagine a toddler without much supervision on this island, there's all kinds of trouble that they could get into. But she says, you know, you couldn't get lost because you couldn't miss hearing the ocean. You could hear the ocean all the way across the island. And of course, we've been lost many, many times in the forest, we kids. But we were not lost because you, all you had to do is keep walking till you could hear the ocean and you come out to the sand hills and the beach. You couldn't get lost on Baldhead Island. And it, it makes me think about um, sometimes, you know, we can be a little smart yes. with the uh, tourists here on Baldhead Island. And my favorite question you can get is, where's the beach? And, uh, you know, the kind of answer is, uh, well, all around you, we're on an island. <laughs> so I, I couldn't agree more with Margaret Swan Hood here, you know, just keep walking in any direction and you're eventually going to come out to a beach. She asks, uh, did they have a school teacher? And, uh, yeah, she's saying that the second assistant lighthouse keeper's wife served as the teacher. And they uh, first met in the cottage, the second cottage, at what is now known as Captain Charlie's Station. So not only did Captain Charlie, as the principal keeper, live out here on Baldhead Island with his family, he had two assistant keepers that assisted him in the operations at Cape Fear Light Station, and their families lived out here on Baldhead Island as well. So Margaret Swan Hood is telling us that Miss Mary Byrne, uh, who is the wife of the second assistant keeper, served as their teacher out here on Bald Head Island. She said when they're not uh, doing lessons, they're climbing trees, they're swinging on vines, uh, all kinds of things. She said, no, they were never bored. I didn't even know what the word was we didn't. Us kids, we just had a beautiful life on Baldhead. It was free and just wonderful. And that ocean was our swimming pool and the island was our playground. I'm kind of jealous. I would have loved to have this island as my playground of growing up. She continues to talk about how wicked the ocean was. She says that you respected 
the ocean, that wicked thing, the ocean. So um, when the tide was in there, they had rules about how you could get in or out of the ocean, uh, told to them by their father, Captain Charlie. She says, we were taught the tides. We were not supposed to go into the ocean when the tide was going out. We could not go swimming in a northeast wind because that could give you a cold every time. You were exposed to something in the wind that would make you chill, you know, and we didn't. And if you're out here and you're familiar with Bald Head, yeah, those northeast winds, uh, they're, that's the cold days on Bald Head Island. You want that wind coming from the southwest, and those tend to be the more warmer days. And we're experiencing that right now. It's like 80 degrees one day and 60 degrees the other. It's lovely spring season. So all kinds of other mischievous things they did. They would uh, go up and down the creeks on these boats. So you had the lighthouse boats and then you had the coast guard boats. And how they got on and off of Bald Head Island before our lovely ferry system and a marina is they would access the saltwater marshes or those creeks on the northern perimeter of Bald Head Island. So it seems like they very much enjoyed um, getting ferried back and forth from Southport or up and down the creeks just for fun on all those uh, boats. They would go out to Middle Island, they would go out to Bluff Island, which is uh, two other islands within this Smith Island complex, Bald Head Island being the most southern or the largest island here. And, uh, you know, they say, or that she continues to talk about the Boyd family. And we brought up the Boyd family previously, uh, last week. The Boyd family owned this island, Palmetto Island, uh, during the 19-teens and the 1920s, and even into the early 1930s. So uh, Margaret Swan Hood was a, a preteen or a teenager while this island was owned by the Boyd family. So she remembers when Thomas Franklin Boyd renamed Bald Island into Palmetto Island. She remembers when he built a hotel and a big, beautiful pier uh, to attract uh, tourists, early uh, tourists to Bald Head Island. And she remembers that they were from Hamlet and that they had all these kids who ended up being Margaret and the other Swan children's playmates. She remembers Lula and Ethel and Celeste and Cliff and Bob and Tom and Dick. They were uh, lovely playmates. They really looked forward to them because you think when the boy children came over here, it probably uh, at least doubled the uh, child population of Bald Head Island. So it's like, now you had double the playmates on this giant playground that is known as Bald Head Island. She also played with the children from the Life Saving Station. And we have brought up the Life Saving Station last week. Uh, that was these, er these early uh, Coast Guardsmen who lived uh, out towards the Cape, not far from where Margaret was growing up at Captain Charlie's station. So it seems like those surfmen, uh, who are the enlisted men in the life-saving service, brought their families, brought their wives, brought their children out here to Bald Head Island. And she remembers having those children as playmates as well. Now, uh, something else that, uh, who, it's just one of my favorite things because it be so politically incorrect nowadays, is she remembers when they were exploring uh, that they would hunt turtle eggs. Now, can you imagine hunting turtle eggs in the 21st century? Yes, she's saying that they would go out and hunt these sea turtle eggs hundreds and hundreds of times, she's saying. They would sell them over in Southport and uh, they would leave some be, but if they were especially good, they would make turtle duff. Turtle duff is basically a cake and thankfully Ethel Herring in this early history of Bald Head Island, known as Captain Charlie and Lights of the Lower Cape Fear, she uh, was able, through the Hood children, to write down or record the recipe for turtle duff. So when Margaret is saying they'd go out and collect the eggs, they would bring them back to their mother, Marie Rose, and uh, along with two dozen turtle egg yolks, 
as Margaret is saying, you could only cook the yolk. The white wouldn't cook at all. It would just say watery and gummy. Ooh. So Turtle Duff called for two dozen turtle egg yolks, half cup granulated sugar, three fourths cup of rising flour, half, tablespoon, uh, half a teaspoon of salt, one tablespoon of shortening, one teaspoon of vanilla extra, extract, and a half a box of seedless raisins. And uh, you'd whip that all together, you'd put it in the oven, and it made basically a, a sweet cake that they knew as turtle duff. And it was quite a treat for these children in the uh, late spring and early summer when all the sea turtles would arrive back on Bald Head Island and uh, lay their eggs. I don't think uh, anybody's making turtle duff nowadays. I'm thinking that's a, just a little bit illegal uh, nowadays. The, uh, our counterparts at the Conservancy would not appreciate that very much, nor would uh, the other members of our community here on Bald Head Island. She says that sometimes they would ride them, they would ride the sea turtles when they came up onto the beach. She says they could lift an enormous amount of weight when you think that they're just uh, toddlers. And uh, she said, no, we'd stand right up on the back of them because they were so flat, a turtle is flat back. And when we were kids, we just stepped right up onto them and they'd carry us off. We loved them. We had them named and everything else. And uh, we couldn't stand it if they would be killed one. Maybe once every two or three years, they'd butcher a sea turtle and everybody loved to have turtle meat. She says the kids cried and uh, raised all kind of cane uh, but uh, every now and then they'd get some nice turtle soup. So it seems like they grew pretty attached to those sea turtles, just as our community now grows attached to these sea turtles. So uh, you folks out there listening, we have a few listeners. So let me know what you think about that. Uh, I don't, you know, let me know uh, if you agree with me. It would not go over so well out there. And, and let me know where are you listening from. Uh, you know, what's your connection to Bald Head Island? Perhaps you volunteer for the sea turtle patrols nowadays. So Margaret continues in this oral history talking about what other types of animals they had over here. She said they had cattle. Uh, so they had cattle for milk. Um, they had some goats out here as well. So it seems like some other livestock uh, out here. So a small farm, if you imagine. This uh, oral history continues on and she goes really on and on about what it was like um, to explore the island and what other types of critters. It seems like they got hung up on the critters. It was started by the turtles and then they go on about the domesticated animals. So then they continue this oral history by discussing what other types of animals were out there that perhaps were not, uh, not domesticated. And Margaret Hood says that the scariest thing that they came across in the maritime forest were snakes. And uh, she tells this story, I think the scariest thing that ever happened was a snake. Snake chased me around the beach. I think that was as scared as I ever was. And I was a grown woman, I had been married for a good while. But my sister and I were going down to the beach and I saw this snake's trail and then it was going this way. And I said, that looks like a whale of a snake. I wish I could see him. Most of them just make a little trail, but this was what they called a coach whip. And they go this way. I imagine that when they're recording this, she's, she's saying there's a big old trail. So she continues that they finally catch up to this snake by following the trail. They caught sight of them. And then she said, well, I looked and here he come. And he was up like this. See, he was going like that, sticking his head up and down. So I run and run and run and I found a stick and I said, I'm gonna kill him. I went after him and she went down the road, her sister running away from the snake just as hard as she could go. That thing turned on me and when I got up to him, I seen that it was one of the biggest snakes I ever saw. And he was a coach whip snake. And of course, you know, they're aggressive snakes. As I said, he just knew just as good when I lost my nerve because he turned right around after me. So I ran up out of my shoes as hard as I could and I thought for sure that my sister would defend me. Uh, and she beat him off of me. But of course, uh, eventually as the snake turned around, we took off running as well. 
I think that, that's a curious thing. We're going to talk about the British here on Bald Head Island and continue that story we discussed last week uh, with Flora MacDonald. And one of the most famous generals in the American Revolution, while he was spending time uh, at least around the Lower Cape Fear region, we're not sure if he's writing this account from Bald Head Island, uh, but one of these islands in the Lower Cape Fear, he discusses seeing coach whip snakes as well. Uh, so we'll follow up on that uh, this week. So just uh, continuing on this oral history, uh, folks, give us a shout out. Let us know where you're listening from out there, what your connection is to Bald Head Island. If you have any uh, questions or perhaps you have some experiences with sea turtles or snakes out here on Bald Head Island. Now, um, she discussed in that that she was an older, um, uh, an older child uh, when that snake was chasing her and that she was married at this point. Uh, well, believe it or not, uh, she met her husband here on Bald Head Island. Um, and I think that one of the experiences that really brought Margaret Hood out of childhood and to adulthood was the death of Marie Rose. So in 1915, shortly after uh, the birth of Augustus Norton Swan, uh, Marie Rose contracted tuberculosis. And about just a few days before she eventually dies from tuberculosis, they get her back over to Southport. And she's nursed uh, by this lady named Bessie. Bessie is her nurse. Marie Rose eventually succumbs to tuberculosis over in Southport. And Margaret says here that Captain Charlie looked at Bessie and says, now what am I going to do? full-time job and all these kids. And Bessie clearly took that to heart. And there was a little bit of a spark. And shortly thereafter, Bessie and Captain Charlie end up marrying. Again, Bessie being his late wife's nurse. And they're gonna have three more children. The first unfortunately lived only about a month long, but Henry and Reese, uh, live to, to old age. Uh, so that is something that a lot of people confuse about. We like to say that there are, you know, all these children out there at Captain Charlie Station that are being raised. Uh, well, Captain Charlie had two wives. The first wife passing away in 1915, Marie Rose, to tuberculosis, and he ends up marrying uh, Bessie, the new wife. And uh, Margaret goes on and on about Bessie. Uh, she says she calls her a city girl. <laughs> uh, she says that um, she grew up in Charleston. She was a city girl. She was a Catholic. Uh, and she says that that uh, caused a little bit of getting used to uh, in this family that, that were Methodists. And one of the, uh, one of Margaret's stepmother's favorite experiences on Bald Head Island is when the lighthouse service would bring a library to Captain Charlie's station. So the lighthouse service furnished lighthouse keepers these traveling libraries. That they came in a trunk and she says, yes, we had a library. The lighthouse service furnishes a library. I think it was every six months they would bring it. We took every kind of magazine that you could imagine, and my stepmother loved to read and passed away a lot of the time reading. She says she didn't sew, she wasn't the best cook, she could not make a sampler, which was a, you know, a type of sewing exercise, but she loved to read. And she says, oh yeah, my mother's mother used to stay with us a lot and uh, she taught me how to sew, so it would be her step-grandmother, but they were all Charleston ladies. Uh, so um, you can imagine trying to assimilate from Charleston or an urban area moving to Bald Head Island. Uh, it, it would take a little bit of getting used to, that's for sure. Now she brings up Old Baldy. She says, Old Baldy was off limits for us 
because way down on this end of the island, and she's recording this, uh, recording this oral history from Southport. So when she's saying um, on this end of the island, she means on the western end of the island. And she remembers the final keeper's cottage built here on, uh, around Old Baldy of, of what we believe three keeper's cottages throughout history. She says, yes, it was a nice two-story house with a nice long porch all along the front and the back. And she gives us a clue about what happened to that final keeper's cottage. She said it burnt. Somebody left a fire in the fireplace or something and it burned down, that beautiful home. And she recalls that it was the Boyd family. She says that family from Hamlet, those nice people, my playmates, that lived uh, in that beautiful home before it caught fire. So you can recall last week we were discussing that the Boyd family found refuge in that abandoned keeper's cottage during uh, the last pandemic uh, that we've experienced as Americans, the Spanish influenza in 1918 throughout 1919. Uh, so it's right around the same time period that Margaret Hood is recollecting. Interview interrupted by a pressure cooker. That's funny. <laughs> you never know what will happen in these uh, oral histories. Hey, give us a shout out if you're listening in there. We've got quite a few folks, uh, you know, kind of quiet here this morning. I know many of y'all will be listening in the future on Instagram TV or on our YouTube channel. Uh, you know, just uh, give us a shout out or a holler. If you're listening into the future, comment on, we'll get back to you. We we'll love interacting with all of our guests. Uh, it's been quite an experience. We've been realizing that a lot of folks are reconnecting to this island since their plans have changed due to this pandemic. Now, uh, we discussed, um, so Margaret Hood, she becomes an adult, really. She's about uh, 15 years old when her mother dies and her stepmother joins the family, and that's her initiation into maturity or adulthood. She really kind of becomes more of a mother figure uh, in her late teens uh, rather than a child, helping raise uh, all these children. She, uh, Mike, good morning, Travis. Enjoy your history lessons from Irwin, North Carolina. Well, hey, Mike, thanks for listening. Uh, we, uh, we appreciate you joining in. Uh, Mike, what's your connection to Bald Head Island? We're, we're very curious about that. So as a, a teenager here on Bald Head Island, uh, how does she end up getting married? Because remember when that story is discussing about the snake, she says, um, yeah, I ended up uh, you know, getting married out here. Well, it's because all these Coast Guardsmen are being stationed uh, on Bald Head Island. So around the uh, time that Margaret's mother passes away to tuberculosis, the old uh, life-saving service station on East Beach is, um, is decommissioned and a new station is built on South Beach. And it's that station that becomes a Coast Guard station when Congress consolidates the Revenue Cutter Service and the Life Saving Service to create the modern Coast Guard as we know it today. So there are a lot of bachelors in their late teens, early 20s, out here on Baldwin Island, working at the Coast Guard station. Uh, they're lonely. There aren't too many women around. In fact, the only women around are the girls or the children of uh, all these lighthouse keepers out at Cape Fear Station. So it only makes sense that some flirtations, uh, some a little bit of spark or a little bit of love can go in the air uh, by um, all these kind of lonely teenage girls and all these lonely teenage men at the Coast Guard Station. And during this oral history, she recalls how she met her husband here. She says, one day we were coming to town. So they're trying to go over to Southport on those creeks, on the boats. And uh, we were coming with some Coast Guardsmen. She says it had to be a routine. As you go to town uh, once a day uh, and it kind of became a routine for them. And they're jumping on the boat, and she says, there was this man. 
He had on his blue uniform and his white cap. And when I looked up at him and he looked me square in the eye and I said, Honey, I never saw nothing like you before. <laughs> so she says to her sister, Esther, Who is this? She says, I had to whisper because Merle, eventually her husband, was standing right by me. And I said, Who is this Coast Guardsman? And he responded, Merle Hood. I said, well, who is this Merle Hood? She said, Jim Hood's brother. And they knew Jim Hood. He had been living down here, uh, coming down from Michigan about every summer. So they went on to the post office over in Southport. They come back home and eventually there's a little bit of party that evening at the Keeper's Cottage. And Captain Charlie comes out in the middle of the night and he says, hey, I gotta get up. You're sitting out here hollering and carrying on on the porch. I gotta get up and go relieve the assistant in the morning. I want you all to get down there to go on to Cape Point, which is Cape Fear. So everybody grabbed their girls, Margaret Hood recalls, to go down to the Cape. And Merle reached up to me and he grabbed me. And when he did, the goosebumps popped out on me, and golly, I was so thrilled. So we got going together from then on. And uh, the rest was history. They got married uh, shortly thereafter, and they lived to a, a ripe old age together. Uh, unfortunately, they were married in 1928, it says here. Um, I think I want to end this by one of the last things that Margaret Hood says. Uh, in this oral history. She says that uh, Baldhead Island was the sweetest part of my life. And it brought me joy, it brought me a wonderful childhood, and most importantly, it brought me the love of my life. And Margaret Hood, she lived in this area. Uh, Merle made a career out of the Coast Guard. Uh, so it brought them uh, all across the United States. Uh, eventually it took them to the West Coast. But they eventually come back to Southport. And uh, if it weren't raining, I would have gone to our, our archives, a uh, separate facility kind of across the island, and when I, brought, I would have brought the original. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot because we don't want to damage that valuable newspaper clipping. But I just want to show you that in 1994, Margaret Hood is here on Baldhead Island, you notice, with a walker. She is here on the lighthouse grounds visiting uh, her childhood over here, recollecting for the Old Baldy Foundation with a walker. Nothing was going to stop Margaret Hood from getting back to Baldhead Island. Now, if you would like to read the entirety of this oral history, because I just uh, brought out some highlights, you can find this oral history online uh, at oldbaldy.org. If you go to our main menu, the history tab, it has a line item called subject files. And we discuss or define subject files on Sunday over at the chapel. It's a collection of an assortment, a hodgepodge, of different resources such as newspaper clippings, oral history transcripts, pamphlets, uh, and the whatnot. So you can find the entire transcript of this oral history uh, via our website for your own pleasure. There's a lot more, a lot of funny uh, items here that I just couldn't get to today. So join us this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We're going to discuss uh, part one of the Generator Society. These folks that lived out here in the 70s before electricity was delivered to the island uh, will be bringing out some more oral histories uh, from that era in Baldhead Island's history. And we'll be taking you to one of those homes that was built in the 70s for the Generator Society folks. So again, hey, wash your hands. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you can find all our previous uh, videos on Instagram TV, on YouTube, or on Facebook here. We appreciate your support, and we'll see you all in a future episode. Thanks, everybody.